Trust, amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and come on them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray, O God, and just instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by the gift of the same Spirit that we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in this consolation through the same Christ our Lord. <coughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Pius X, Saint Isidore, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Okay, so um, yeah, can do better. These flies throughout this, but so last time, two weeks ago, uh, last week we had the feast of the Assumption. Today we have the feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Happy feast day! Um, and two weeks, so two weeks ago we covered confirmation, and today we're just going to finish that topic, the sacrament of confirmation. And um, I just want to anticipate talking about the effects of confirmation, and I like this to start off the catechism lesson um, with something that Pius X used to do when he, when he gave catechism lessons. He was just like, he said, you know, you need to provoke the, uh, the students to some sort of examine, is it examination, self-examination. Last time we were thinking about, oh, well, you know, do I appreciate the sacrament of confirmation, the fact that, oh, I'm a confirmed Catholic. Um, I've been, uh, I've received the sacrament that gives me graces to live the spiritual life fully, um, to, to appreciate that. So today I just want to uh, mention that, that confirmation is one of the three sacraments that gives a character, an indelible character, a mark on the soul. And the character is a supernatural power, so it confers a power on the soul. The, the, the character of baptism is a power, the character of confirmation is a power, the character of holy orders is a power. In the case of baptism, it's the power to receive grace through the other sacraments. If someone is not baptized and they're given one of the other sacraments, like confession, Holy Eucharist, whatever, they receive no grace. It doesn't work. So the character of baptism is it's basically the power to receive. It's a passive power. Confirmation um, is contrasted with baptism in that baptism is, is, is more for the individual. Confirmation um, has a, it's, it's a power that's it's more for the person to do something for the church, for the common good of the church. I'm just going to quote this theological author, um, yeah, Father Harry, not Father Harry, but uh, Father Echi, I want to try to put the exaggerated French accent on it. Um, so he says, while baptism ordains us to live and act as befits Christians in view of the development of the divine life within us, confirmation directs our activity for the common good. In baptism, says St. Thomas, man living for himself, receives the power to do what is required for his personal salvation. But in confirmation, he is commissioned to take his place in the spiritual combat being waged against the enemies of the faith. And so the confirmed Christian is empowered to make public confession of the faith that is in him for the defense of Christ's visible religion. Baptism is the beginning of the Christian life. It's your entrance into the Christian life. And you receive this sacrament for your personal sanctification so that you can save your soul. Confirmation is a sacrament that brings you for the fully full development of the spiritual life and makes you equipped and ready to go out as a member of the mystical body and profess the Catholic faith um, to play your role on the side of the city of God against, you know, the, the, the city of the world, the city of, of Satan. Um, so, Father Ari he explains farther, further, while the characters of baptism and orders tend to constitute the acts indispensable for worship, namely the sacraments, 
So without them, the sacraments simply would not exist. The character of confirmation has a different end in view. It has the role of defending, preserving, conserving, and strengthening the worship already instituted. It constitutes its recipient a firm and official defender of Christian worship. So let's just clarify this by indicating the three sacraments and the character. So you, you have baptism, um, holy orders, confirmation, And baptism is the power to receive the sacraments. Holy orders, the power to give the sacraments. And he's saying that confirmation, the power to defend. The sacraments or Christian worship. Confirmation has the role of defending, preserving, conserving, and strengthening the worship already instituted. Preserving, defending, preserving, conserving, defend, preserve. Conserve seem to be the same thing. Um, the sacraments, the Christian worship, and this this remark about this, the special nature of the character of the confirmation it's it's it, it brings you as as um, up to the point where you're a, a full fledged member of the church militant and you're ready to go out and do public things as as a card carrying Catholic. Um, you're ready to be a public figure of uh, the Catholic Church and do all that you need to retain your faith, but also to assist the church in her work of conquering the world for Christ. And what, what Father Ari wants to do is to say, we've, we've got baptism and holy orders, both have, give, give a character that pertains to the liturgy. Baptism gives you the power to receive the, the sacraments, the, the, which is the liturgy. Holy orders gives the power to give the sacraments. What does confirmation do? Well, it makes someone a defender, preserver of the, uh, uh, the sacraments. It strengthens the worship already instituted. And, I mean, if this is the case, then the sacrament of confirmation is something that, that, it's, that it's the grace that comes from that sacrament that assists us to have the proper respect for our Lord, to want the, the right worship for, for God in, in the Mass, um, that will, would make us like not want communion in hand, or not want an irreverent liturgy, um, that, would, that would move us to say, no, I need, I need to preserve the traditional Latin Mass, because that's, that's the right worship of, of God. Um, to defend the, the, the traditional mass um, because that's the proper worship. So this, in the, from this perspective, this sacrament is really important for traditional Catholics. Um, we, we are, it, it's, it's a battle. <laughs> We've been battling for the mass for, for decades now, um, just holding on to it. And um, the... We, we, we just have to have the faith that, that this sacrament of confirmation is, if, if we're here, if we're, if we're standing by the traditional mass, um, is we, um, why is it the bishop? Why is the bishop one who does sacrament of confirmation? I think I might have mentioned this two weeks ago, but no, that was a really long time ago. <laughs> why not the priest? I'm a priest, typically the bishop. 
Um, well, here's what St. Thomas says in, in the Summa, question 72, article 11 of the third part. He says, in every work, the final completion of the work is reserved to the supreme power. Um, so, the faithful are baptized by a priest and confirmed by a bishop. So what is what is the work here? The work is the perfection of souls, the sanctification of souls, making souls perfect. And the beginning of that work is done by the priest when he baptizes the person. The completion of that work is done by the bishop when he confirms the person. See, Thomas gives the example of a statue that's finished by the highest craftsman. craftsman. So perhaps you have the lower craftsman can do the, the rough work. The rough work, but when it comes to the fine work on the statue, um, you you have to get the finer craftsman, the master craftsman. Okay, and he's going to do the fine detail on the statue, or a letter. He says a letter typed by or he, by St. Thomas doesn't say this, but it's another example. A letter typed by a secretary is signed by the manager, um, signed by by the the senator or the president or whatever even if it's typed up by by somebody else um, he has that's necessary for the work to become complete and really it's it's not very effective unless that happens so the faithful who are the building of god and the letter of the holy ghost we are we are like uh something being built up by god and um, god sends a priest first of all to start the building and then to do the finer work with the finer details, he sends the bishop, the master craftsman, who has the fullness of the priesthood, and he completes that work. Or the priest is like the secretary typing up the letter, and the bishop is like the one signing it. We have some examples in Scripture of this, of Acts of the Apostles, where um, you have less, lesser ministers working with people, and they say, well, there's another step, but we can't do it. We need to call in the big guns. So in Acts chapter 8, there is one of the deacons, you know, the, the apostles ordained deacons. They ordained seven deacons. One of them's name was Philip. And Philip is in Samaria. And um, people gave heed to him. Um, they believed Philip as he preached the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. So Philip's there. He's preaching. They're believing. He baptizes them. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John. On their arrival, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he had not come upon any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So this was something that Philip could not do. Obviously, he would have done it. He could have done it. They were his people. But he didn't do it because he didn't have the power. So he calls to the two apostles, Peter and John. Then in Acts 19, a um, story from the journeys of St. Paul, where 
St. Paul goes to Ephesus, and he finds certain disciples who have been preached to by Apollos. Apollos, who doesn't, who's not been fully instructed in the faith. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They said to him, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. He said, how were you baptized? They said, with John's baptism. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. So St. Paul is able to do this higher ministry as well. But um, there is clearly a distinction in Scripture between the, the lower ministers and the higher ministers. The lower ministers are able to baptize, but they're not able to confirm, to bring the Holy Ghost upon them. Um, there's various decisions throughout the history of the church in um, the medieval times it was it was uh, just the bishop it was only the bishop who confirmed Pope Innocent the first said that it may not be done by anyone other than the bishop Pope Clement the sixth asked uh, in a profession of faith that that uh, this belief that, or this profession that only the bishop can confirm. Over time, there is this nuance introduced where uh, between the ordinary minister and the extraordinary minister, the ordinary minister of the sacrament and the extraordinary minister. So the ordinary minister being the bishop, the extraordinary minister being a priest who is delegated. So the Council of Florence said that the bishop is the ordinary minister. Right, we we uh, remember when the Council of Florence was, um, but what century? Uh, Council of Florence, yes, right. Good, good, yeah, yeah. Fourteen hundreds. It was in the fourteen hundreds. But then one of the canons of the Council of Trent says, if anyone shall say that the ordinary minister of Holy Confirmation is not the bishop alone, but any simple priest, let him be anathema. So Trent also makes that distinction in the 1500s, uh, about a century and a half later. Um, so it is um, an old practice that, that the priest be an extraordinary minister of confirmation. But the church doesn't like to do it historically, has not liked to delegate this too often because she wants those who are receiving the sacrament to understand its importance. And she wants the ceremony to correspond to the nature of the sacrament. So if it is the nature of sacrament that it brings you to Christian perfection, then it is appropriate for the bishop to do it. Um, and if you just have your parish priest, same one who gives you Holy Communion, hears confessions and so on, if he's the same one who gives you confirmation, and you're thinking, oh, this is just, Another day at church, right? Um, it, it's not, it's not, nothing extraordinary about, about the sacrament. So like pre-Vatican II, when, when um, priests were given permission to administer confirmation in remote areas where there were very few bishops, um, yet it was, it, they were told, make sure it's not the parish priest. It can be, it can be like the vicar apostolic or um, some priests delegated by the Holy See, but not the priest that everybody sees every day. There should be some pomp and ceremony to the, the uh, administration of the sacrament. And obviously it's, it's, it's very special here when, when the confirmation happens. You know, the, the, the bishop comes in um, and we, we have this, this very special ceremony that the children are, have been prepared for a long time. Um, and we, we try to do a practice with them, show, okay, this is, this is how you conduct yourself in, in, in the reception of the sacrament, and, and there's the sponsors there. So the church in the past only gave permission for the priest to do it on rare occasions. I think now it's a lot more common um, for the priest to, to con do confirmation. 
Here's what the new Code of Canon Law says. Canon 884 says the diocesan bishop is to administer a confirmation personally or is to take care that another bishop administers it. If necess necessity requires it, he can grant the faculty to one or more specific priests who are to administer this sacrament. For a grave cause, the bishop and even the priests endowed with the faculty of confirming in virtue of the law with a special grant of the competent authority can in single cases also associate priests with themselves to administer the sacrament. So it's, it used to be the Pope alone who could give this permission, but now it's more at the local level. The bishop has the power to designate one of his priests for the administration of confirmation. Okay, so let's talk about um, the sponsors of confirmation. You know, you know, you have you have a sponsor. You have a sponsor of baptism, and you have a sponsor of confirmation as well. Um, why do we have a sponsor at with confirmation? Um, because I mean, you you're coming perfect, right? Fulfill the duties, something should happen. Well, that's baptism. Oh, that's, that's baptism. So the godparents make sure that the child will be instructed. To help that child to pray and listen to their, or to do their um, confessions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to make sure that they're taught the faith and raised in the faith. If something happens to the parents. Um, whereas confirmation, we, we, again, we have to have recourse to analogies, um, comparisons. We say, okay, um, you don't just need a guide when you're learning an art, but also when you've completed learning it, you still need some sort of mentor. Catechism uses the example of the soldier who goes through basic training, okay, and he's finished his basic, basic training. Now he, he puts his uniform on. He, he's got his guns and everything. He's, he's equipped. Does that mean he just goes off on his own now? No. No, he still needs someone to guide him when he goes out to battle, to, to direct him, instruct him. And when he comes back from battle, to, again, to, to be there for him. Um, you know, or you can think about firemen or policemen. Even once you once you're starting to go out as a policeman out on the beat, and you 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 need you would be accompanied by a more senior member of the force who who you would be with, and he would show you the ropes. Um, not only those who are beginning to be Christians at baptism, but also those who have been perfected in their adherence to the Christian life need assistance. So the, uh, the new code of canon law gives five things um, that are necessary to be a sponsor. First of all, the sponsor must be chosen by the one to be confirmed by the parents or the person who's taking place of the parents or in their absence by the pastor and the sponsor must have the aptitude and in intention of fulfilling that function. Um, obviously, somebody has to be designated, somebody has, you don't just, you don't just pull someone at random, um, some random guy, but uh, someone who's in position to designate the sponsor who chooses him. Secondly, they must have completed the 16th year of age. This is older than it used to be in the old code. The old code allowed 14 years old. Unless the diocesan bishop has established another age or the pastor or minister has granted an exception for a just cause. Um, yeah, I think in tradition, a lot, a lot of times, there's brothers and sisters are... are uh, sponsors for confirmation and we tend to confirm younger than than in the Novus Ordo 
um, tend to confirm children in third grade. It's our practice. Um, so they would be, you know, like eight or nine years old. Um, and maybe they're, they want their 12 year old sister to be their sponsor, what have you. Um, so, but the new code says 16. Number three, it must be a Catholic who has been confirmed and has already received the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist and who leads a life of faith in keeping with the function to be taken on. Um, has to be a practicing Catholic. You know, you don't, you're, if you're going out to battle, you don't want to pull some veteran out who's, who hasn't been fighting for 10 years, right, to, to, to be with you. Um, you want someone who's actively fighting. He must not be bound by any canonical penalty, legitimately imposed or declared. Um, so hasn't been excommunicated or um, other, otherwise in, in trouble, the church. And must not be the father or mother of the one to be confirmed. So... This must be someone different. Um, father and the mother have a natural duty to take care of of the of the child. Um, you want someone else who uh, who's given the supernatural duty. Okay, what about the recipient of confirmation? Who who is to receive confirmation? Be baptized. Yes. Yes. Um, so, what if someone said confirmation is not necessary for salvation? So, not everybody has to receive it. What, what would you say to that? Say it without it, but it's probably harder. It's harder. It's harder. And the church obviously frowns on someone taking their spiritual life so haphazardly, you know, so flippantly that they're just like, oh, don't need it. Don't need it. Um, and would even say that it's a sin to despise the sacrament. It's gravely wrong to despise the sacrament. Everybody is supposed to get confirmed. Everybody is supposed to get confirmed. Do you remember at the, the beginning of this chapter, the catechism says, <clears throat> oh, you know, it's getting really bad these days in the 1500s because <laughs> people, uh, people are, are not having the proper respect for the sacrament that they should. If ever there was a time demanding the diligence of pastors and explaining the sacrament of confirmation in these days, certainly it requires special attention. When there are found in the Holy Church of God, many by whom this sacrament is altogether omitted. People are like, what's in it for me? I don't need this to be saved. Get it. I don't, I don't need it. You know, I've got to take time out. Got to be there on a special day and everything. Got to answer these questions. To get grilled by the priest or whatever, uh, forget it. I'll just take a pass on that one. Oh, Protestant mentality. Just uh, lukewarm, very lukewarm. Um, Trent was was um, that that canon from Trent. You remember the canon from Trent that I that I quoted um, in this class about about the minister of confirmation. You remember what Trent said. On that, yeah. If anyone says that the ordinary minister of confirmation is not a bishop but a simple priest, that would be anathema. So the tendency of the Protestants was just to devalue all sacred ceremonies, to cheapen them. They wanted to cheapen the ceremonies. <clears throat> 
Whereas the church was very jealous at keeping, giving the proper reverence to the ceremonies. And I say one of those aspects was you have the bishop show up for confirmation. Only in rare circumstances does the priest do it because the bishop's <coughs> presence indicates the particular nature of the sacrament, that it's bringing someone to the completion of the spiritual life. So you have the, the one with supreme power, the fullness of the priesthood to confer it, um, not the, the, the priest who does, who does your baptism, who does your um, confession, who does Holy Eucharist for you, who does extreme unction, does your marriages and so on. So that's the Protestant spirit. Um, this spirit is just simply lukewarmness. Okay, so the church, um, the, the catechism and the church say no one should omit the sacrament of confirmation. Everybody should receive the sacrament of confirmation, and it's gravely sinful to despise the sacrament. The catechism gives an example from the um, scripture on the day of Pentecost. What happened? There were Our Lady and the apostles and others in the upper room. I can't remember, was it like 120 people who were there? Um, let me just look this up real quick. Since Ascension. They were all together in one place. The days of Pentecost, they were all together in one place. It doesn't say how many people were there. Um, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of, as of a violent wind blowing, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them parted tongues as of fire, which settled upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in foreign tongues, even as the Holy Spirit prompted them to speak. So you have this house, you're, you, you know, it's in Jerusalem, you have all these houses, there's this neighborhood, and there's the sound of a violent wind, and these tongues of fire descend upon the one house, and all the people who are in the house. And the Catechism says, this is a symbol of what is supposed to take place in the church. The house is the church, those who belong to the household of the faith. And all those who are in the house, who are Catholics, receive the Holy Spirit. So this is a symbol that everybody needs to get confirmed. And obviously, everyone needs uh, spiritual increase, needs to be led to the perfection of the Christian religion. That's the whole purpose of our life, is to be led to perfection. We should all want to go to heaven right away when we die um, and do what we can. To, to do so, to become perfect. Yeah. So does that, what does it designate the sex of, as I know like in Novus Ordo, you could not be there a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, in tradition, you usually have a man if you're a boy. And a right. So, but it didn't, it doesn't designate. It does not. It does not. Yeah. Um, did you get him, Greg? Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> so, as far as the age goes, um, in the Latin rite, which we belong to, you have to have reached the age of reason. So you have to be, the catechism says, not before the age of seven and not after the age of 12. Sometime between the ages of seven and 12 when they receive confirmation. But of course, in that time, typically First Communion was not received until uh, children were 12 years old. But now we, we receive Holy Communion at the age of six or seven. And as a result, um, we can't confer, we don't wait till they're 12 for confirmation. We do it in third grade. Then as, the, as far as the dispositions um, for the reception of confirmation, this, this uh, sacrament is a sacrament of the living. We, do we know what that means, sacrament of the living? 
<laughs> I think that's true for all the sacraments. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Gerard. Correct. Correct. You have to be in the state of grace. Sacraments of the living are sacraments that you receive in the state of grace. What are, what are sacraments that you don't receive in the state of grace? Baptism. What else? Penance. You can't be in the state of grace, but you can also not be in the state of grace to receive um, the sacrament. So with confirmation, it's a sacrament of living. You're supposed to receive it in the state of grace. What if you're not in the state of grace? You go up to receive confirmation. Will you receive the sacrament? Or do you have to do it over? You won't benefit from its grace. Exactly. Exactly. So you will receive the character of, of confirmation. You will have received the sacrament, but you will you will not receive the grace. Your soul your soul is in the state of death. Um, so the, the character will be no good for you, and you will have to confess it. It's a it's an, it's a sacrilege. It's a sacrilege. You know you have the sacrilegious communion in the state of mortal sin. Go up, you go up to receive holy communion, and it's a sacrament of the living. You only receive it in the state of grace. And you're treating a sacred thing with contempt. So that's what a sacrilege is. And when our Lord comes, <clears throat> if it's, it's, it's truly our Lord, he comes into your soul, does he give you grace? No, he doesn't give you grace. Because you're, you're, you're in a state of enmity with him. You're separated from him. And you, you're receiving the sacrament of union with him at the same time that you're separated from him. So of course, it's not going to work. Um, and on the contrary, it's going to make the soul better, better than it was, than it was before, or in, a, in a worse state. So confirmation is a sacrament of the living. It's to be received in the state of grace, not for validity, but for lyseity, or to be licit, to receive it in the state of grace. With a spirit of faith and piety and a spirit of repentance, for one's sins, and preferably fasting. We fast before our Holy Communion, right? Why do we do this? We, we, we do this to prepare for the, for the coming of our Lord and that we don't have, any, we don't have anything else in, in our stomachs. The time out of reverence for Him. But we also do it to prepare ourselves spiritually. We, we, we have it indulged. And material things and um, we're more spiritual and also we we know that we receive more graces through penance um, that penance helps dispose our soul for graces if we've if we've chastised our body so this is recommended for the recipient of confirmation it's also re recommended for the minister confirmation when we, we need to go when the bishop goes to administer confirmation that he fasts beforehand, the, the day, the day of, of giving confirmation so that he can confer it in the best dispositions possible. Okay, so the, the last thing we need to talk about are the effects, the effects of confirmation. There's three effects of confirmation that are mentioned by the catechism. What do you think they are, these effects of confirmation? Strength. Yes, strength. What else? Yes, yes, you receive the Holy Spirit. Um, we would call that an increase in grace. Fuller measure of the Holy Spirit in the soul. 
What else? Um, that goes along with strength. It goes along with strength and increase of grace. What what else? That we've already talked about. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The character. So first of all, the strength um, makes us stronger. That, uh, confirmation makes us stronger Christians than we were before. Maybe I'll just read to you what Catechism says on this. Um, it is particular to confirmation to perfect the grace of baptism. For those who have been made Christians by baptism still have in some sort the tenderness and softness, as it were, of newborn infants, and afterwards become, by means of the sacrament of chrism, stronger to resist all the assaults of the world, the flesh, and the devil, while their minds are fully confirmed in faith to confess and glorify the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hence also originated the very name Confirmation. No one will doubt. So you're stronger. Stronger. You're, you're better able to resist temptation. You're better able to live your faith. You're better able to, to separate yourself from things that will take you away from God. Um, of course, we think of the world and the difficulty that Christians have in the world today um, with just not being liked. <laughs> Being a sort of a reproach, a living reproach to the world, but to be be strong, it takes it takes greater strength. But even within the Catholic world, to to be a, a traditional Catholic and uh, traditional Catholics are kind of frowned upon, um, but but not to give in to human respect. They oh well, I better do what everybody else is doing because that's that at least I'll get along with people, right? Um, so confirmation will give us the strength. To forget about things, not consider those things as very important. Then the, the increase in grace, um, the level of sanctifying grace. You know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a level of sanctifying grace in our souls. And this is the degree to which we are capable of participating in the life of God. Grace is the life of God in our souls. But each person participates in that life, um, lives from that life to a greater or lesser degree. Like we, 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 we speak of people whose, we say their life is ebbing away um, because the, their, their life is, is at, a, at a low ebb. They're, they're not able to do the normal functions of someone who's healthy. Whereas we say with someone else, they're full of life, right? Um, they're, they're very healthy. They're very active. The same thing is true for the supernatural level with the soul. Um, you have souls who are at a low ebb. The, the the flame of faith in them is 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 like a pilot light, you know, it's like down to a small flame. Um, and the virtues are are not very active in them. Um, they're they're not listening to the inspirations of God. They're not being moved by God in their life. Whereas with other people, the faith is very active in their life. Um, it's motivating their decisions. They 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 easily pray. They they don't find it difficult to pray, but they they um, move themselves to pray each day and to be generous in their prayer. So, what we're saying is that confirmation: someone who's confirmed has a greater capacity to live that life, to live the fullness of the Catholic life, of the life of grace. And then with the character, um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's a power to do the public things of the faith, to go out as a card-carrying Catholic and um, work for the interests of the church, for the common good of the church. So those are, are the three um, effects of, of confirmation. Uh, it's not one of the most appreciated sacraments, um, probably because we just receive it once, Right, and that's and that's it. 
I mean, we'll see the ceremony once a year. So out of sight, out of mind. Um, but it's important and a very it plays a very important role um, in our spiritual life. So anybody have any any questions about that? Yes, Jackie. So would you um, consider confirmation a uh, mandatory before you do like a sacrament of marriage? I mean. Yes, yes. Um, in most cases, it is mandatory. It is mandatory. But in some cases, um, it's permitted for someone to get married before they've been confirmed. Say you have someone who converts and they're baptized right before their marriage, and there's no bishop around, there's no possibility for them to be confirmed. Well, they have to promise, you know, I'm going to make sure to get confirmed. I've had a couple of cases of, like that here, and, you know, and I have to follow up after they get married. I'm like, okay, well, this is when the confirmation is, and you you need to get confirmed. So they, they just got baptized a few few weeks before they got married. Um, well, normally speaking, the person who's getting married needs to be confirmed. So is the marriage valid if it didn't happen? It is. It is. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, if the if the person's not confirmed, the marriage is still valid. Even if marriage is, is kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> Tony's happy about that. <laughs> He's a lucky man, right? <laughs> uh, but even even people who are not baptized can be validly married. Because of the fact that marriage is a contract between the two people. And if they're willing to engage themselves to what is of the essence of marriage, then it's a valid marriage. You have two pagans who, who are willing to bind themselves to what is of, of the essence of marriage, then they're truly married. That, that okay, they're going to have kids, um, they're going to be together for life, and they're going to be faithful to one another. If they're willing to pledge themselves for that, then they are married. And they are married, yeah, even if they're not baptized. So that's what you could say, married in the eyes of God is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously, it's not a sacrament. Right. Not a sacrament, but it is a real marriage. There is a natural institution of marriage. That's, that's the, the one thing about marriage is, is there is a natural equivalent to the supernatural sacrament. So if, if two people get married in a natural way, like you're saying, it's a valid marriage, how would they sacramentalize it later if they convert to the faith? Yeah, um, I don't know that they would need to do anything. I don't know that they would need to do anything. Um, I think it might happen automatically, but that's a good question I would need to check on to confirm. Um, so yeah. all of these sacraments that we're talking about, the Novus Ordo versus us versus, are they taking it seriously or what are the steps necessary? As far as we're concerned, we were always going to church. You go to the priest and you say, we want to get married. You do all the stuff and they never check it. Or, I mean, we never, I mean, how does that, you know? So they never checked if you were confirmed or not? I don't know. No, they just say. You just, they you say, just well, get married? You can get married, but at some point you need to. Is what they told you? Yeah. Yeah, so as I say, I mean, we would, if we had a practicing Catholic come to us, we would, we would say, you need to submit your confirmation certificate. That's proof that you've been confirmed. Mm -hmm as part of the investigation we do before we get married. And if they can't supply that, you know, or if, if they haven't been confirmed, we're like, well, you need to get confirmed. Um, and sometimes it's just a case of someone who hasn't been practicing for a while. You know, like they, they got baptized and they received their first communion, but they never got confirmed. There's definitely cases like that. We shouldn't be surprised. I mean, if even in, Think about the, the time of Trent, 
um, 1500s in you know, late medieval Christendom, the time of the Renaissance, just lots of people running around who are Catholics and they've never been confirmed. And this is perhaps one of the reasons why the church made that rule. Well, you've got to get married in front, of, in front of a priest. It didn't used to be that way, but the church made the rule um, just to, to protect the institution of marriage. So they make sure, okay, people are doing it properly. But even that, still don't do it. Yeah. Okay, you know, I, you know, yeah. You go, it's not important. Right. Sure. 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 Yeah. And, and they're, the crisis, right? yeah, I mean, they, they, they're not fulfilling their duty. I mean, I, I, know, I know there's uh, Nova Soto priests out there who definitely want to do what they're supposed to do. But at the same time, the, the, the atmosphere of the Nova Soto. Um, is kind of slapdash. So um, even even the way they've designed the new rituals, it's it's kind of make it up as you go. Um, there's so many options. For instance, um, that it doesn't encourage the the priest to to be really serious about okay, I, I need to take this very seriously and do this proper way, or what have you. Um, it it just there, there's much more likelihood that a traditional priest will be taking it very seriously and be trying to check all the boxes. You know, when he when he's doing the, the sacraments and Nova Soto priest, just because of the of the environment of the of the atmosphere of the rite itself, um, or the atmosphere in which the the traditional priest lives out his priesthood, as opposed to the Nova Soto priest, um, which is which is unfortunate. And they want they wanted to make the liturgy freer. They wanted to have more active participation of of the faithful. They they wanted to make the liturgy more adaptable to local customs and so on. And and what happens is is just. Um, there's there's so many options, there's so many variations that the priest is just like, it doesn't really matter that you follow any sort of protocol. I mean, some, some get that impression. I don't think that's proper, you know, but, but some get that impression. So I got, this protocol is not really important. It's because I, I, I'm given so much leeway. So I, I'm, I'm honest, I, I don't really have to take it very seriously. So you said even if a couple of pagans told you, who would they have to, does it make a difference who the minister is? I mean, I know the ministers basically are the husband and wife, but does it depend on who marries them to? Do they? No. No? No, I mean, it can be a justice of the peace. So those law, that law only applies to Catholics. No. It's be a justice of the so peace. So my, my son, you know, I'll say, well, okay, so you're maybe married. I says, but you're not married in the eyes of God, which is really all that matters. So that's really not a correct statement then. No, I mean you're either married or you're not married, you know. Um, yeah, I don't know about the whole. Like in Colorado, they they even allow you to get married without anybody around, just the couple. You can just show up and say, "We went in the woods and we exchanged vows," and there's no witnesses. I don't know if that works in the eyes of the church. Um, uh, that's it. that's that just seems really strange to me. You can just the couple can just declare we're married, um, just apply for a marriage certificate. So if you were, but okay, so if you started practicing the sacraments again or whatever, you was you would not do like a sacramental marriage. I mean, a sacramental service or 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 something. Um, like an exchange of vows. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, we call that a convalidation, and I just have to double check on that. That's whether that's going to happen anytime soon, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, but I mean, if you if you're talking about Catholics um, who got married outside the church, then their marriage is not valid in the first place. So it's different. So the marriage doesn't exist. So it has to happen. The ceremony has to happen. But if we're saying the marriage already exists, and then people come into the Catholic faith, um, does their marriage become sacramental just by that happening? Yeah, that's what I need to, to look up. So it's funny, so we talked all about confirmation now, but we never really talked about the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. Oh, uh, yeah. 
So is that basically, so you have an increase in the seven gifts? Yes. I mean, I'm just following the catechism. Um, we can talk about the seven gifts if, if you want, but um, I'm just following the catechism, and it doesn't it doesn't go through the gifts okay. in that catechism. Um, we can I've I've done that before um, to to go through each gift, explain what it does, and so on. Um, but yeah, there's there's books out there as well that explain that by the by Holy Ghost Fathers. Holy Ghost Fathers like to write about that. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, let's uh, say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Our Lady, help of Christians. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Thank <clears throat> you.